for this opportunity to be impacted by your eternal word. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place in the hearts and minds of each and every person under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people that agree with that prayer said, Amen. I always like to begin with a cute story, and so I have the story of a Sunday school teacher who gave her class the assignment of drawing a picture of one of their favorite Bible stories. Well, one little fellow got several stories jammed together, and of all things, he had a picture of an airplane with four people on it. And she's looking over his shoulder and she says, Johnny, uh, would you explain this picture to me? He said, oh, that's the picture of the Hebrews' flight from, Israel, uh, from Egypt. The flight from Egypt. Yeah. And she says, well, who were those four people? I assume one looks like a woman, that's probably Mary, and the other is Joseph, and the baby there is baby Jesus. He says, yeah. She said, who is the fourth person? She said, oh, that's Pontius the pilot. <laughs> Pontius the pilot. Yep, so, I gave her an A for creativity. <laughs> <laughs> so the little fellow was really uh, <clears throat> with it there on the Bible stories. The flight out of Egypt. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cute. You never know what you're going to get in kids' Sunday school classes that keep you on your toes theologically sometimes. For this morning's message, I have a, a title, What Color Are Your Glasses? What color are your glasses? Now, I'm not talking about the frame that holds your glasses. I'm talking about the lenses of your glasses. What color are your glasses? And I'm reading, I take that from a, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at verse number 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But... When I became a man, I put away childish things. Now verse 12. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also known. We uh, all know that people wear glasses, corrective lenses, to help their visual field be cleared up. The human eye has several things that go on with it. Uh, you can be what's called farsighted, which means you can see things at a distance very clearly, but things up close aren't quite so clear. That's called hyperopia in the medical terminology. And if you are uh, nearsighted, you see things up very close, very clearly, but things at a distance aren't quite so clear. So you have to have corrective lenses for that. Nearsightedness is called medically myopia. So you have hyperopia and myopia. And the lenses that the ophthalmologist will uh, prescribe for you are designed to correct the various uh, visual acuity problems that you have. And so all of us are familiar with that. Uh, in fact, <laughs> uh, we have expressions in our vocabulary that we use all the time and we don't even think about it. But I wanted to bring those up because some of these things are, uh, while they're simplistic in their uh, nature, they are actually very profound. Ever hear the expression, looking through rose-colored glasses? Rose-colored glasses. What does that mean? Well, someone who is accused of wearing rose-colored glasses usually is a, a being a, accused of looking overly optimistically at everything, sometimes better than the things really are. They just are very overly optimistic rose-colored glasses. And so uh, the, this optimistic outlook, everyone thinks that, well, they, they really have a strange view of things. Well, no, it's not really a strange view. They just take, choose to take a better view than the pessimistic idea. Uh, the lenses that you have in glasses can be of various colors. Uh, I brought some props with me today. I don't usually do this. But I have <clears throat> some night riding glasses. <laughs> and these are yellow. Now that definitely changes the view indoors here. But when you're driving at night and you put these kinds of things on, it reduces the glare and it gives you a whole different perspective on the nighttime. Indoors it's quite white. But we can put on yellow colored glasses and it has a function, but it does change the uh, visual field that you have for that particular time. 
you can have what is called polarized glasses. Polarized glasses. What are Polaroid glasses? Well, first of all, you have to understand that when sunlight hits a flat surface, light normally scatters in all directions, but when it hits a flat surface, light tends to be reflected in a straight line, or it's polarized. And that horizontal light we know as glare. So when you look outside on a sunny day, and it's, there's snow on the ground, it's very bright. Why? It glares at you, or the light off of a windshield or window of a car. It's a flat surface. When the sunlight reflects, it's in a very glaring kind of thing. That's polarized horizontal light. What polarized glasses or lenses do is they are designed to take out those horizontal wavelengths so that when you look at a visual field, the polarized light is blocked and you see everything else and it makes your visual uh, field much more clear. And so fishermen, for instance, can put on polarized glasses the sunlight reflecting off the water is blocked, and they can actually see fish in the water. Um, you can look up in the sky, and because the glare from reflection off of clouds and so on and so forth is reduced, then you can see color better. Everything looks very much more uh, distinct and colorful with polarized glasses, and so on and so forth. But these polarized lenses block a certain wavelength of light. Uh, there is a kind of a lens called a euchroma, E-U-C-H-R-O-M-A, euchroma lens. These are very special lenses. They're something like the uh, polarized lenses, but they are what's called notch filter lenses. What's that all about? Well, long story short, you have different receptors in your eye that respond to colors. And in people that are essentially colorblind, the receptors, for whatever reason, sort of blend all the colors together. They don't see blue or red or yellow very well. Everything is sort of a, a bland, grayish kind of color pattern. But when they put on these euchroma lenses with these special filters, what it does is to block, except for very narrow bands, the colors reflecting to them. And so if you look on the internet, for instance, and you type in this euchroma lens, you'll find videos of people that for the first time in their lives, they put on a pair of these glasses, and all they can do is, <laughs> because for the first time in their lives, they see color. They've never seen color before. They're shocked. It's the, even their shirt and their shoes and the green leaves, of everything is so much more distinct because now instead of colors muddling together, they're very distinct, one from another. And so not only are there, they can see color, they see more clearly because these euchroma lenses block all this muddling and only narrow bands of color. So they're very, very clear in what they can see. Uh, and then, of course, most all of us are familiar with another kind of prop that I have here, regular sunglasses. Joe Cool. Okay. Now I put sunglasses on, and indoors, it, 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 hello, it's really dark out here. They're in here. But you put on sunglasses. Why? Because if the light is too intense, you block some of the light with lenses. Some are darker, some are lighter, but these are pretty dark. So in here, this is like really dark. <laughs> now, if I were out driving around on a sunny day, this is perfect. That's why I like these particular glasses. But we don't think it's unusual to put on sunglasses when there's bright light. I have known people who were very sensitive to light and they had to walk around all the time with dark glasses on. Why? Because if they took their glasses off, even indoors, they'd be squinting. The light would be too bright for them. So sunglasses or dark lenses, uh, various shades, can uh, enhance our vision or block so much light that we're not uh, hurt in our vision by uh, the intense light. Okay, so we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, these two verses I like to read, especially number 12. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I also am known. Glass making in biblical times was a uh, uncertain art form, and uh, it was 
often producing glass, that was not the clear material that we're used to today. It was uh, hit or miss. Some glass that produced wasn't too bad. Uh, a little waviness, a little this, that, and other thing. But sometimes it was discolored. And often if you didn't have a very good materials available, the glass that was produced was glass, but it was pretty dark. <laughs> you really couldn't see a whole lot through it. And so that's why there's this verse that say, we see through a glass darkly, because some biblical forms of glass were quite dark. You just couldn't see through them very well. Some light would filter through, of course, but not very much. But the point of that verse is, for now we see through a glass darkly, it's not really talking about the natural world. It's talking about the spiritual world. And if you think about it, we live our lives in this physical realm. We're, we're used to seeing things that are objects, solid objects around us. But how many of you know the spirit world is just as real? It's just that our eyes, normal eyes, and these lenses that we use to correct our normal vision can't see into the spirit realm. And what the writer of Corinthians is saying is that oftentimes, if you think about it, what we are literally looking into the spirit realm when we read the Bible, we're looking through a glass darkly. We really don't see what all is there to see. We can't because our vision is impaired. The glass lenses are dark. We can't see all the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ the way we should, but one day we will. The word translated darkly in that passage actually means a riddle, a riddle or an obscure intimation. You're talking about something, intimating about it, but it's kind of obscure. It's like uh, uh, talking sideways or only giving hints of what you really mean. And just so, our spiritual vision gives us a limited knowledge of what the spirit world is about. But when we get to heaven, we're going to see all the things that are spoken of in this book very clearly. We will no longer be looking through a glass darkly and have things obscured. So I would, on this, in this place, have lenses that... Don't let me see everything. But in heaven, I won't have dark glasses on. I'll be able to see very clearly. I won't even need these things, by the way. And so uh, what I'm getting at is that we see through a glass darkly means we don't know everything that we should. We can't see everything that we ought to be able to see simply because we are limited in our natural eyes that we cannot see clearly into the spiritual realm. But one day we shall. Given that, and speaking of um, spiritual vision, I'd like to take a little bit of poetic or literary license here and launch off into something about vision that is not necessarily talking about your eyeballs. Let's go over here to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter number 13. And in that particular chapter, I'd like to start reading at verse number 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. In that we find these words, Therefore I speak to them in parables, because they see, see not, and hear, they hear not, neither do they understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which said, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Seeing they shall not see. How can you see but not see? The point being, you are seeing only the natural but you're not seeing the spiritual implication of what it is you're looking at. And so today, we are in this place, and we are seeing someone stand up in front, flap their gums about the Bible. And so you see this individual talking, but what you don't see is 
those words that I speak from the word of God are, have spiritual power in them. There is spiritual power going out to you. And as that spiritual power comes forward and it comes at you, sometimes you, uh, you are remiss in understanding just what you're dealing with. It's not some lecture out of a book. It is rather the living word of God. And we put on our glasses so that we see only what we want to see or color it the way we want it to be colored. But in actual fact, there's very much more than what we actually see going on. Can you understand that? Okay? Let's go over to Romans, the book of Romans, chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7. And in that chapter, I'd like to begin at verse number 21. Romans 7, verse number 21. I find that a law that I would, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God and after the inward man. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. The seeing in those particular verses refers to spiritual discernment. And so I would submit to you, there are spiritually discerning glass lenses that we can put on. When we read the Bible or we hear it spoken, we have to change the lenses that we're wearing so that our the eyes of our mind, the eyes of our understanding, understand that we are dealing with spiritual principles, not just physical words out of a book. And that gives a whole different importance level to the words we are hearing. Um, and also, I'd like to make a little side note here. If you've never heard this before, you haven't been around the block enough time, some of us have, to hear someone talk about, they have the gift of discernment. The gift of discernment. You say, what's that all about? Well, again, if you haven't heard it, count yourself very blessed. But for those of us who have run into someone who's got a gift of discernment, what they really mean is, they can be critical of you because they see every little thing that's wrong with you. Did you see the outfit she had on? That doesn't do anything for her. That was too high a dress, and that was too tight a top, and those shoes did not. I have to get to the sermon. She has this spirit that she's wearing these kinds of outfits. And did you hear what that man said? That old boy was has got to be some kind of rascal. I can discern. That's the gift of discernment. It's a critical spirit is what it is. And by the way, there is no such thing in the Bible as the gift of discernment, okay? You'll find uh, enlisted under the gifts of the spirit, the discerning of spirits, but that's an entirely different matter from the gift of discernment, which means you can criticize somebody and say, oh, I have a gift of discernment. That's not a gift at all. That's just being critical in the vision. So if you haven't run into one of those people, count yourself blessed. All right, so I'd like to now go to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter number one. And in Mark chapter number 1, go all the way over to verse number uh, 40. Mark chapter number 1, starting at verse 40. There came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, in verse 44, and said unto him, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. I call these two verses spiritually obedient lenses. Spiritually obedience lenses. What's that mean? When you see something like this from the Bible, for instance, Jesus was talking to this man. He's saying, see that you don't go out and tell anybody. Now, what did the man do? He went out and told everybody anyway. He was not obedient. He did not have on his lenses to see that Jesus was giving him a directive. 
don't go out and play this up. I don't want that popularity because then that makes it difficult for me to move around without people uh, mobbing me and I can't minister the way I want to. But the man went out and did it anyway. He didn't have on spiritually obedient lenses. Can you see that? How about in Acts, the book of Acts, chapter number 11. Acts chapter number 11. And in that particular chapter, starting at verse number 10, we find these words. This is uh, Peter on the rooftop, and he's seeing a vision. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And, and behold, immediately there were three men already come into the house where I was sent to me from Caesarea. Uh, we can keep on reading there. Uh, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. Verse 13. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I should withstand God? Peter was literally seeing a vision. He was awake. He wasn't asleep. So the lenses that he was blessed with at that point in time was spiritual vision lenses, discerning spiritual visions. I have heard of people who have been sound asleep and the Lord has given them a vision of something that's going to happen or things that are going to happen and uh, are happening at that moment. And there's no way that the person who's in bed asleep could ever have known that. It was revelation to them. And that vision, they saw it as so clear and so distinct. It was like they were living that particular event. And the next day or the next week or whatever, that same series of events happened exactly as they had seen while they were in bed asleep. They saw a vision. Other people have what's called an open vision. They're just walking around and the Lord says, look over here. And as the person turns to look, they see, it's like a movie in front of them. But there's no movie, they're seeing into the spirit realm. And they see things that our natural eyes cannot normally see. You say, brother, what are you talking about? Well, I'll say this, right now in this room, there are all kinds of angels moving around. You say, how can you be so sure? Because I brought two of them in with me. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, the Bible says. So I brought two of them in with me. I've heard of accounts where a minister was preaching and some woman out in the audience just started screaming. And, Lady, what is wrong with you? She goes, look, look. And he turns around and there is this nine or ten foot angel standing there, big fellow. He's like, hi. And he said, uh, are you my guardian angel? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, uh, good to see you there. <laughs> Big man. We get the, the world has this uh, pathetic idea of angels, that there's some little naked baby flying around with little tiny wings on their back, little bow and arrow. Ding. That's not what angels are about. Angels are men. They're big men. They're powerful men. And the Bible talks about uh, one night, one angel killed 185,000 men. They're nothing to be messed with. They have tremendous power. And as the worldly idea of this little tiny naked baby flying around with a little bow and arrow as a, an angel, that, that's foolishness. Angels are big. Well, the room is filled with them. You just can't see them. But I believe before the Lord returns, it's not going to be unusual at all for Christians to see angels. We're going to be able to see into the spirit realm. Don't be frightened because they're with you all the time. They never leave your side. They always behold you and always before the face of God. They have the ability to report in, as it were, on everything going on in your life. And they're here right now. You just may not be able to see them. You say, well, brother, how do I know that they're here if I can't see them? 
Well, uh, let me go this way. I don't see anybody in here with an oxygen bottle, so how did you know that you, when you walked in this room, there'd be oxygen here? He said, oh, that's foolish, there's air in here. But how did you know it was oxygen-containing air? You just assume that. But you can't see the oxygen. The chair you sat down in. Did you do a structural analysis on the chair to see if it was strong enough to support your weight? You say, well, no, brother, I, I know it will support me. How do you know that? You just assume that. You took it for granted. I'm saying you just assume that there aren't angels because you can't see them. But if you saw one standing here on either side of me, all of a sudden your eyes would get as big as saucers and you would say, yeah, now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> that is one big fellow. And how about if you were in the congregation of the church where the man was uh, preaching and he stopped long enough for a song to start up and all of a sudden you hear this choir but there's no choir in the choir law. And different people out in the congregation start yelling, look, look. And he turns around and the choir loft is filled with angels and they're all singing beautifully. A whole choir loft full of angels. I believe, again, we're going to be seeing those kinds of things, but those are commonplace that have already taken place over and over. It's not something new and unique. We'll be able to see those kinds of things more and more. The point being, when we have spiritual discerning glasses, we'll be able to see into the spirit realm many times more clearly than what we do now. And we will be able to have a uh, vision, as it were, of things in heaven uh, much more clearly when we get there because we'll be able to see without glasses and so on. In Romans chapter number one, let's turn there, please. Romans, the book of Romans, chapter number one. And in Romans chapter number 1, I'd like to start reading at verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Things which are invisible are clearly seen, and they refuse to be thankful. I would like to submit that another kind of glasses, lenses that we can put on, are thankful lenses, lenses of thanks. For the most part, we're all aware that we have family, relatives, friends, uh, and so on and so forth. But how many of us are really thankful for all our friends? for all the blessings in our life. You know, a roof over our head, warm air when it's cold outside, uh, the family that we have, the, the children that are uh, growing up and having uh, families of their own, uh, our moms and our dads. Well, I don't know about the mother-in-law, but we'll leave that one alone. And so on and so forth. Uh, the, the family and friends that people have, we should be thankful for that and express that thanks to God. We should put on our lenses of thankfulness and look around us. Just that we have warm air, comfortable chairs to sit in, are we really thankful for that? Most of us don't put on our thankfulness glasses very often. And I would submit that, what color are your glasses? Are they thankful or are they unthankful lenses that you're looking through? Okay? How about uh, Mark chapter number 10? Mark. The Gospel of Mark, chapter number 10, and I'd like to begin reading at verse number 17. Mark, chapter 10, verse number 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these I have observed from my youth. Verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, 
One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. I'd like to first point out that this is one very sad fellow. Why is that? Because in verse 22 it, <laughs> we read, And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around about and said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus told this man, Come and follow me. What was the one group of people that Jesus ever said that to? His disciples. Jesus was literally offering discipleship to this gentleman, and he walked away sad and turned it down because he was in love with his possessions. But Jesus, looking on this man, knew that he had a good heart. He had tried to obey all the commandments. He was living a religious life, very, very good. But when it came to giving up those things to follow Jesus, he couldn't do it. His love was in things and in money, not in the things of God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, you cannot serve God in mammon. What was this young man's problem? He was a very rich man, well-to-do. He meant well. He lived his life, obeyed all the commandments. He told Jesus that, and Jesus, looking on him, loved him. But the problem was he turned down discipleship. My point, though, isn't so much to criticize the young man. My point is Jesus had on glasses of love. He looked on the man in spite of his loving mammon more than God and said, I love you. Hey, buddy, I love you. And the young man turned down that love and that discipleship because he was more into things and money and riches, mammon, rather than God. I would submit that it doesn't take money necessarily, but other distractions of this world that cause us to take off our glasses of seeing things in love, and rather we operate in worldly vision and act like the world. I submit that Christians ought to put on every day lenses of seeing in love and look on things in love like Jesus did, not like the world does. Those lenses are of different colors from the world, so I would ask, what color are your glasses? Lastly, I'd like to, uh, oh, I'd like to point out Hebrews chapter 10. One more point here. Hebrews chapter number 10. And in Hebrews chapter number 10, I want to look at one verse, number 24. Hebrews chapter 10, number 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Again, let us consider one another in love. You can't consider someone unless you look at them. Observing someone means you're looking at them in some level. And so if you're looking at them, the Bible says, look at them in love. It's so easy to criticize. It's so easy to be harsh and mean and spiteful. And you don't have to go very far in this world to find people like that, don't point. And anyway, it's just the whole thing that people in the world are mean-spirited. Hello. I'm sure you've run into at least one or two of them. Okay? We, as Christians, are not to be that way. We are instead to look on those situations in love. And am I saying that's easy to do? No. Your flesh wants to give them <laughs> the five-fold ministry here, you know, and let them have a piece of your mind. But that's not love. That's worldly retribution for the way you happen to feel about something. The Bible says, look on them, consider them in love. And those glasses through which you look may not want to be very loving, but if you put on the glasses of love, then you ignore their pride and their foolishness and their offenses to you, 
and you just go on like Jesus did. Can you see that? The lenses that you have on make a difference. What color are your glasses? Now let's go over to John chapter number three. The Gospel of John chapter number three. And in John chapter number three, I have one verse I'd like to read. John three, verse three. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We're talking about vision and lenses. If you have lenses that are focused on the world, on this natural thing that we live in, then the world becomes a place of your regular focus. And that's all you see. But Jesus is saying, unless you get a different perspective, and put on lenses that allow you to understand there's a spirit world out there that's very real. You may not be able to see it, but you put on the lenses that let you see that. Now you will understand there's something more to this life than what meets these eyeballs that we have in our bodies. And when you have, as I'm doing right now, sharing the Word of God with you, the words paint a picture. Words are pictures. If I say dog to you, you get a picture of a dog. If I say big black dog, your picture changes to some other vision. If I say big black furry ugly dog, now you've got a whole different picture and so on and so forth. Words paint pictures and you, however you process those words, give you that picture. So Jesus is saying, Unless a man is born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. You will never have a vision of heaven, and you will be kept away from God's great gift because you refuse to put on the lenses of salvation. You won't be able to see past the natural world. And this is the world's problem. They consider the word of God foolishness. They won't receive it because, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, look, we, we believe in a, a God you can't see and give your money to a, 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 a church or something. You don't know what they're going to do with the money. And then they say they're serving God with it and they're, they're buying cookies or something. Well, what that man of God does with the, the money is none of your business. That, it, he's re responsible to God. Your point is you have to be obedient. But he's not trying to get money. He's trying to get you into heaven. Can you see that? And so my point being, if we put on lenses that let us see the salvation offered to us in the Word of God, then we will see heaven, we will be born again, and we will one day be with Jesus. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, we find in part these words, But if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For a man, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confess and believe, believe and confess. It's one thing to believe something, but it's a whole other thing to express that. I'll give you an example of how distinctive that is. In one message that I heard about, a man was sitting in a church, and the minister had a vision that the Lord revealed to him that man. It's like he lit up by a spotlight overhead. And the Lord said, he thinks he's saved, but his problem is he's never confessed me. Have him make a confession. So the Lord, uh, the minister said, uh, sir, he just interrupted his sermon. He said, sir, uh, would you stand up and tell us what you believe about Jesus? So he stood up and he said, well, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died on the cross, they buried him in a tomb, three days later he rose up, and he sits at the right hand of God, and he, after he died for my sins, he's alive forevermore. He sat back down. The minister said, good, and he went on with his sermon. After the message was over, that man came up to the minister and said, something happened on the inside of me when I said those words. He said, I've come to this church for years and years. And I never felt like this, but when I said something, something happened. 
minister said, yeah, you got born again. You asked Jesus to come into your heart. You believed it. You just never confessed it. Can you see that? And so he got a vision of spiritual confession when this minister asked him just to stand up and say what you believe. A lot of us don't say what we believe. We think we believe. We try to believe. We try to live right. But we've never confessed Jesus. We've never said, Lord, come into my heart. Make me a born again child of God. And from this point on, I'm going to say, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. Because we're wearing the wrong color glasses. We see only the things that religion has pointed out to us, but not what the Bible really teaches. We must be born again. The most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We've all heard those verse, that verse before. But what it's saying is God loves us so much that he wants us to be born again. Uh, in 1 Peter, we find the words, God does not desire that any should perish, but all should come to eternal life. All come to life. God doesn't want anybody to perish and go to hell. Hell was never designed for people. It was designed for Satan and his angels. His demons, I should say. And the fact that anybody, any person goes to hell is against the will of God. He does not want people to go to hell. But some people are bound and determined to go to hell, and they make light of it. Oh, I'm going to hell because my, all my friends are going to be there. That is so sad. They don't understand what they're saying. They turn down the greatest gift. Why? Because they make light of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. But God says, if you will, ask Jesus to come into your heart. He will come in. He'll forgive all your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. As a matter of fact, let me go one step further and shock maybe some of you. All of your sins have already been forgiven. Everything is already done. You can't do anything that God doesn't already know about and hasn't already forgiven. The point being, all you have to do is receive what he's extending to you, the offer of forgiveness. But so many people are too prideful to receive that forgiveness. And one man asked the Lord one time, he said, Lord, what would you have me preach about? The Lord answered him without any hesitation. Go tell my people <clears throat> how much I love them. They don't know how much I love them. So what I'm presenting to you today is the love of God but I'm putting it into a form that if you change glasses, you'll see very clearly something different from what the world says. And you won't have the obstruction of dark glasses that block some of the truth of the Word of God. But when those salvation lenses are put on, now all of a sudden you'll see Jesus wants you to ask Him into your heart. And see as Jesus sees with the lenses of love in your daily walk. Not the gift of discernment, but in helping people, in talking to them, expressing what's on the inside of your heart, and they too then can be with Jesus. Amen. Did you get anything out of this today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name to thank you for revealing to us the power of different color lenses through which we can look. Not necessarily blue and yellow and green and dark brown, but lenses that will help us to see the world differently, see our lives differently, see our families and relatives differently. We thank you, Father God, for having opened our eyes to the need to change the color of our glasses. In Jesus' name, and everyone that agreed with that prayer said, Amen. I thank you all for showing up today. Again, I trust that you got something out of this message. And we'll see you next time whenever I'm scheduled to be here. I think that's probably in two weeks, maybe one week. Okay?